If you have your Bible with you, we're reading from 2 Kings in chapter 4. And it's a very short passage this morning. 2 Kings in chapter 4. Where we finished last week was about the pot of broth, that there was death in the pot, and how the sunflower was brought, or meal as it was called, and put into the pot, and then the people right, remained alive. But they were going to break into the story at verse 42. Verse 42. And there came a man from Baal Shalisha and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley, and full ears of corn and the husk thereof. And he said, Give unto the people that they may eat. And his servitor said, What shall I set this before an hundred men? He said again, Give the people that they may eat. For thus saith the Lord, they shall eat and shall leave thereof. So he set it before them, and they did eat and left thereof, according to the word of the Lord. And may God bless his word this morning again to our hearts and to our needs. I think one of the advantages of studying a character in the word of God is that you're introduced to other people that are part of their lives. And so I trust that you get as much blessing out of uh, the story of Elijah and Elisha as I get out of preparing it. Uh, There are some of these people, and I've never spoken about them before, nor perhaps did I know an awful lot about them. And one especially is this man from Baal Shalisha, who came and gave an offering at a time of tremendous need. We have been covering the aspect of the story that there was famine in the land of Israel. We're told in the latter or in the earlier verses there was great uh, dearth in the land, and the Elisha and the prophets uh, with him didn't have much to eat. And last week's story encountered the big pot of stew that was made, and then the story about death in the pot. And we said that it didn't take very much to ruin our testimonies or to bring death in one sense or another uh, in our lives. And so one of these prophets of the Bible college students, they cry out and they said, there's death in the pond and they come to Elisha and there are some flour or meal that is used and that neutralizes the poison and a miracle takes place and the people were able to eat. And in the spiritual significance, we know that that flower was a type of the Lord Jesus and how that in our lives, the Lord Jesus changes everything whenever he comes into our lives. But I want us to notice this man here from Baal Shalisha who came and he brought an offering and we're told the offering was some corn and also 20 loaves. And these were loaves of barley, they were like baths or rolls as we would call them. And he brought them in a time of need. And the significance of the story here is like the New Testament, how God used a boy's lunch to feed a multitude. And how God can use the little that you have or the little that I may have, even in a spiritual sense, and he may use it to feed those that are hungry. Now, we notice that Elisha instructs his servant to serve the food to the hundred men because God has told Elisha there's going to be enough to feed a hundred and there's also going to be some that is left over. And this, of course, is a picture of the foreshadowing of Jesus feeding the multitudes in Matthew 14 and Matthew 15. How God miraculously used a little to feed a multitude. But there are some things that stand out in the story of this man from Baal Shalisha and how he brought the first fruits to Elisha and how that in doing so he was obeying the old Levitical law. And I'll relate to that in a moment or two. But first of all, we have a lovely picture of benevolence here. We do not know the farmer's name that gave the gift We don't know very much about him. We just know where he came from. He came from this place that was given over to idolatry, this place called Baal Shalisha. 
He was one of a noble band of nameless people that are mentioned in the Word of God. In the next chapter, we notice there was a wee girl, and she's also nameless. But the village has got into the Scriptures simply because of this man's goodness. It's possible to make our birthplace famous by living for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this farmer, he gave as soon as he was able to give. I suppose it's true to say maybe many of us maybe wait, or we could say that we'll wait until we'll be rich before we be generous, only to find that the heart can be sour and doesn't want to give. I was reading the story in the New Testament this week about the woman who cast in her two mates into the treasury and in so doing she gave in all her living, all her substance. But this passage here teaches as much as, as believers about coping, about coping in hard times, about coping in difficult times. It also illustrates to me a perfect example about a man who was determined to honour God. And that's what I want us to ask us at the very outset of our service of the Word today. Are you in the Lord's house this morning determined to honour God more than anything or anyone else? This man was. It certainly told in his life. It told in the place he was coming from. He's out to put God First, it is C.T. Studd who says he is no fool, who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I was walking through a cemetery the other night, and I stopped at the cemetery. I wasn't aware these lads were buried in the cemetery, and I stopped and I read the names. I had heard about these lads. I knew these lads. I used to run about with them. In my own saved days, there were wild lads, the lads that I remember. And I stopped and I read, because both of them are now in eternity. One is 54 years of age, the other is 57 years of age. And I stood at that grave, and all I could say was, thank you, God. Thank you that you saved me whenever you did. I run a bike through those lads. Those lads, certainly one of them at least, got very much caught up in the parlour militaries. As far as I know, he couldn't even come into Northern Ireland. I've lost contact with them for years because whenever you get saved, there's a parting of the ways. I thought to myself, 54, 57. I could be lying in this ground too if I had continued in the ways of the world and the path that I was journeying in. But I want to say to your friend, he is no fool, as Stud the missionary said, who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And so this man's determined to honour God. I trust that we're determined to honour God with whatever life we have, whatever we have, whatever God has given to us, realising that those that honour God, God has promised that he will honour. And I'm sure many of us could stand here today and testify to that fact that God always gives his best. In the time of Elisha, we're told that Gilgal, like the rest of Israel, the northern kingdom, was soaked in idolatry. And from Jeroboam, King Jeroboam onward, all the kings had led the people into idol worship with only a remnant that remained faithful to God. This man from Baal Shalisha was one of the folk who remained true to God. As a servant of God, the man from Baal remembered that the first fruits of his increase had belonged to God. In Exodus 23 and verse 19, we're told in that verse, the first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. That is what the law said. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9, Honour the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. The first fruits. 
not the second fruits, not the tenth fruits, the first fruits of all thine increase. To honor God, this man here from Belshalisha had to overcome many obstacles. I don't know what your view is today on tithing. I don't know what your view is today where Malachi tells us in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive. I don't know what your view is. But that's what Malachi says with regard to the tithes. Now we know in the Bible there was the tithes, there was also the offerings. It was the late Catherine Booth who said, teach your children to tithe and you'll teach them to be honest. I told a story in Life Lenders one night there. I think I've told it in the church before. And I know that uh, we certainly always taught our children, no matter what they got, make sure that you give God at least a tenth because God will honor you. And even whenever they were not walking with God, I must say they still I had that... Uh, in them. But I remember telling the story about Timothy. He's not here today, so I can tell it again. And how that Timothy one day, he fancies a quarter of sweets out of the shop here. But the problem was he couldn't tithe and also afford the sweets. And I remember thinking to myself as a parent, well, this is a test. You've got to teach your children to be faithful to God and to honour God. But children have to be taught these things. And so he says to me, Dad, I really want that quarter of sweets, but my problem is I can't tithe and also the quarter of sweets. So I said, well, Timothy, what do you think you'll do? And like what any child probably would do, he said, well, Dad, I really want the sweets and I'll give God the tithe of, uh, at another time. So I said, that's fair enough. That's what you want to do. You do that. And so we came to the shop here. We got the quarter of sweets. He took one of them. He says, Dad, they're not the sweets I thought they were. Now that was a lesson. That was a lesson. And I know to this very day, I know to this very day, and I say this with, with respect and love, of course, I, for Timothy, that Timothy will still always keep the Lord's account. And he'll make sure. Because he'll say to me every now and again, Dad, this is in the, the Lord's account. You teach your children to honour God and God will bless them. I believe that. And here's a man here and he wants to make sure that God has the first fruits of his increase. As you honour God, this man from Baal Shalisha had many obstacles to overcome. The first one was fear. Fear. You read UCB notes yesterday as talking about fear. God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Baal was known for his fertility, but in a time of famine, food was scarce here too. Farming crops did not mature all at once, and so first fruits were the earliest gathered fruit from the harvest. To set aside a portion of one's harvest uh, during a time uh, of famine, it was a real challenge. But it was a true act of fear. I look out sometimes now that uh, Samuel has planted a, a bath full of carrots. They were excellent last year, and I hope they're as good this year. Uh, sitting outside our patio door, and those little heads are beginning to appear. And I'm looking forward to the time whenever they get way bigger, and eventually we'll have lovely carrots and, and other things. Do you imagine having no food? And you look and you see the crops producing, and you say to yourself, I'm in a time of famine here, I'm in a time whenever I need this for myself. But the first fruits, the law demands it. And so here's a man here and he's living in famine. Now, there was no guarantee of a harvest the following year. From a human standpoint, it was entirely reasonable to store up as much as possible for an uncertain future. But this man from Baal Shalisha considered honouring God more important than hoarding goods. It was more important 
I want us to consider this this morning. If we cannot see into the future, shouldn't we put our trust into the one who can? This man's security was in God instead of goods. I suppose there's some of us are hoarders and no one more so than I am. Well, it was rather interesting the other day whenever Timothy said to me, he says, Dad, we're a generation, our generation, that we will put money into experiences more than into things. And I suppose that's true. And maybe they're not interested in, a, in an oil lamp or ruby glass and all those things. I, those things, they wouldn't give very much for them. But he said, we're a generation that would prefer a holiday, a meal, uh, something else rather than things and I suppose that's that's true and there's nothing wrong with that nothing whatsoever but this man's security remember was in God instead of in goods in Psalm 37 and verse 25 David is writing whenever he's old and David says these words I have been young and now I'm old yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. You see, this man had not only had to overcome fear, he had overcome society and culture. Baal Shalisha was earlier known simply as Shalisha in 1 Samuel and chapter 9. We read about it. And we read about how that the city was known just as Shalisha. There was no Baal in front of it. The Baal prefix was added later in honour of the Phoenician god Baal, which was one of the primary idols worshipped in the region at that time. And so the addition of the Baal prefix meant that a town uh, which previously served Jehovah God, which previously honoured God, had now honoured Baal. You know, sometimes I wonder, is that the way we're going in our wee land? We have so many cultures, and it's not that I'm a racist today, I'm not. And as people will tell you, if you look and you study the Irish, they travelled all over the world, mind you, in the past. A lot of them left for America in that, times of famine and so on, and to many other continents. You know, dear friends, with all this, here come so many different valuing systems. And what I'm saying today is, here's a city that once knew God, that once walked with God, but now it's Baal worshippers, and very few believers in it. A people who once served the true God had now turned their back upon God and had turned to worship idols. Is that not the way that our land seems to be going? In other words, this man was living amongst people who had no time for God, do you not feel like that at times? That the Christian has been squeezed out more and more by a society that has little time for God. But rather than being overcome by culture, rather than being overcome by society he lived in, this man honoured God. The corrupt culture context in which he lived I would not be used as an excuse not to do what he knew that what was right, he wasn't going to be squeezed into the mould that he was surrounded with. I know it's true to say that believers do not always live with, uh, they don't have the choice either of living with amongst like-minded people. Believers often find themselves in the midst of a culture that is moving away or has already moved from God. Yet it is in this culture that we must live, we must work, we must play, we must be in the real world, and above all demonstrate the reality of salvation through Jesus Christ alone. Believers are called to be salt and light, whether that's in our family, and our community, whether that's in a fellowship or wherever, we are salt and light. That's what we're called to. But despite the hostility of the world around us and the loneliness of the journey of faith, we must, of course, shine forth for the Lord Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15, which I read the other week, Paul writing to the church at Philippi, he said these words, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. A lot of believers, we don't like those words. 
because they don't excuse maybe our lifestyle. But Paul said to the church of Philippi that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And so the man from Belshazzar overcame the depravity of his culture so that he could honor God, the only true God. And I want to say that we can do the same. We are the same God. We can do the same. We don't have to follow what the world does. People would tell us we do. We don't have to dress the way the world does. We don't have to watch the same programs the world does. We don't have to listen to the same music that the world does. We don't have to go to the same places, adopt the same values as the world does. We don't have to believe what the world tells us. As the Bible tells us we ought not to be squeezed into its mould. We are determined to honour the Lord of hosts. If we are determined to honour the Lord of hosts, then we must walk a different path, just like the man of God from Bel Shalisha. We must determine a different path. He was a man with determination to honour God. Gilgal was a 30-mile journey over a mountain, over the mountains from Bel Shalisha. In Israel, no one in the populated areas would be more than 10 miles away from the uh, Levitical city. So no one would have to travel over 10 miles to give the offering of the first fruits or to offer any offerings. They wouldn't have to travel more than 10 miles. But this man traveled three times that distance to get to Elisha and his men. And that brings me to my next question. How far are you willing to go to honor God? <coughs> How far? It appears that he, that he baked the first fruits uh, into bread because he knew that he had a long journey to make and bread would be easier to carry than barley. Too often we honor God only with what's left over. Only what's left over. I always say, and as I thought about those two lads that are lying in that graveyard today, some of us used to go to the pub and come on a Tuesday night nobody had any money because everything was spent over the weekend. You lived for the here and now. Do I remember saying to our good friend that's in heaven today, the late Margaret Boyd, whenever Margaret used to talk about tithing and all, I used to say, but Margaret, I, I could never tithe. She says, but that's because you're in the world. But I can say one thing, whenever God saved me, I never thought it was right to use my salvation to swell a bank account. A packet of cigarettes back then was quite a bit, and mind you, both Olive and I were both heavy smokers. And as long as we're there cigarettes, I suppose we're happy enough. But I'll say this, dear friend, that it's so easy to give God the leftovers of our lives. Trust whenever that you're saved that you say to yourself, well, uh, God's going to be honoured and whatever God gives to us, he'll be honoured. How far are we willing to drive to a meeting today? Or do we think nothing of driving to Port Roush, driving to Donegal, driving to some other place, but whenever it comes to a meeting, it's too far. We used to travel... Kelly's in Port Roush, that was quite a run. So it was never an issue whenever it came to meetings. How far would you travel to see somebody that's sick? And I'm not talking about a family member. Maybe a brother or sister in Christ. Oh yes, if it was a family member who had travelled to Cork, I'm sure, and back, and think nothing of it. But a brother or sister in Christ that's in a nursing home or somewhere else, and we don't bother maybe even thinking of them. How far would we go to reach a lost soul? How far would we go? This man was willing to go far out of his comfort zone to honour the God he believed in and served. 
You see the challenge is how uncomfortable are we I willing to be to honour the Lord. We all get into our comfort zones. We all have them. I think my wife will say to me her comfort zone is after life lenders on a Friday night when she's the house to herself and some buys the crisps, a good fire on and I, n- nobody around and she prepares dinner Sunday school work. But we all have our comfort zones. We don't like to be knocked about too much at times. But how about reaching out sometimes to the rejects of society, reaching the one nobody really likes and everyone tries to avoid? Now, I'm not talking about those that I read about this week that are flying into Northern Ireland. (laughs) They're professional beggars. That's what they're called. And they're taking a plane into Northern Ireland and sitting in the streets of Belfast or Londonderry or somewhere else and they're sitting begging because Northern Ireland, it is reckoned, is a very generous place to be. And so maybe you read it yourself this week that there is professional beggars who are just flying into Northern Ireland, spending a few weeks here, gathering up a good amount of money, flying back out again. I'm not talking about being made a fool of or that, though I'm sure there are times never we perhaps can be. But I want to say to your friends that no one has ever travelled as far as Jesus did. Jesus left the perfection of heaven. He gave up his divine glory and journeyed to earth so that by his death he could become the first fruits or the perfect offering. Verse 43, we read, And his servitor said, What should I set this before a hundred men? He looks at the twenty barley loaves. He looks at the wee bit of corn. He says, How would this ever feed a hundred? Imagine if you had a house full of visitors last night. Now, there's a few in our house last night because we moved out because Samuel was organizing his camp and so there's camp leaders in that. And I don't know how many pizzas or many things that he cooked. I don't know. I see the rims in the fridge, so there was something left over that maybe we'll enjoy later on today. But you imagine if you had a group of a hundred people come to your house and you look and you have twenty wee bops, uh, bops and you say, but I think there'll be even some left over. They'll all get a good feed and there'll be some left over. You say you're completely mad. And so the servitor said here, what should I set this before a hundred men? And he said, Give unto the people that they may eat. For thus saith the Lord, they shall eat, and they shall leave thereof. The attendant was confused, and he was confined. You see, he's limited by unbelief. His unbelief is caused by measuring his ability to feed so many, rather than the focus on who God was. And the story of the feeding of the 5,000 plus was not something similar, was the explanation. We must learn to take whatever God has given us and then trusting in his will and in his power, the power of God, using it, whatever it might be. The issue here was not the small number of loaves, but the ability to see beyond the loaves to the Almighty. Maybe there's someone here this morning and you're hemmed in and you're shackled in your mind. And you're limited by your availability and your ability and everything else. But you can't see beyond. You can't see out to the Almighty. But this I'll close today. This man planned to come. He could have talked about it. I'm living in a culture where people don't respect God. And after all the fruits of the first fruits, God will understand he's not going to get the first fruits this time because there's famine in the land. God will understand all that. You could have said that. But this man planned to come. It was a deliberate act. He didn't put it off any longer. He didn't. You and I, we need to make preparations We need to lay plans to serve the Lord. We just float through life aimlessly. And we don't set ourselves goals, what we want to achieve. Well, isn't life rather boring if that was the case? May I say to your friends that this man here, it took effort for this man to come. 
He made a long journey to serve the Lord. Doesn't cost, does it really count? There have been many dangers to his life. He made his loyalty to God public. It was not even something that he was uh, afraid of and maybe it could have cost him his life. He didn't mind. All the new, the neighbours, I'm sure, around him, whenever they saw this man in famine gathering up his barley loaves and his corn, they probably said, there's a complete madman. Doesn't he need them himself? Doesn't his family need them? Doesn't his community need them? No, it doesn't matter. He's going to honour God with the first fruits, no matter what the outcome will be. And so I'm sure that uh, society and his neighbours looked at him as a fool. I add today, he gave us all to the Lord whenever he gave the first fruits. In verse uh, 38 of that same chapter, we know that there was dearth in the land. The land was in an awful state. It was in an awful state through crop shortage. Crops were more valuable, so it cost them dearly. Whenever something is scarce, it becomes more precious. I used to listen to the late Noah Raid telling me about the times of war and I, how that she delivered telegrams and uh, way up the country and all the rest of it. But you know what it was like? I know we were talking about the sugar rationing and the tea rationing and all that. We don't talk like that now because we're in a land of plenty. A land of plenty. But these crops were very valuable. He put the Lord before himself. Others may ridicule, others may laugh, but we should always put God first in our lives. Remember he said if we don't, we're not even worthy to be his disciples. We ought to put God first with our time. I wonder how much time do you give God? An hour on a Sunday, a couple of hours in the week, three or four hours maybe, maybe a few minutes in the morning praying before you go to work or before you, you uh, curl up in bed. Putting God first. Putting God first with our talents, whatever those talents may be. And don't let anyone tell me today, you don't have any talents. God has given to you talents. Maybe they're buried, maybe they're hidden. You need to dig them out and get using them. Putting God first with our money. He gives his best to the Lord. Sometimes we give to the Lord what we don't want ourselves or what we're finished with. Wasn't it the late W.P. Nicholson who talked to, who was a Presbyterian minister, who talked about giving God our cast-off rags to raise money for the Lord's work. Now, I have no issues with jumble sales today. Nobody run more jumble sales than my late mother for diabetes research. But there's a difference, dear friend, in that I'm trying to raise funds for the Lord's work God's work done in God's way will not lack God's supply. God does not need jumble seals today to raise money for his work. Abraham had two sons. He had Isaac and he had Ishmael. But Ishmael wouldn't do. God wanted his best. He wanted the promised son. He wanted the best. Any service for the Lord should be our best efforts. Whatever they are. Whether that's in preaching, teaching, singing, playing, praying, witnessing, studying, whatever, whatever. God should have our best. Let's sing our closing hymn this morning.